So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. This is Apostolos Magiriadis. I'm uh, a political correspondent with Sky Television. I'm very happy to introduce Simon Anholt from London, who is uh, with us uh, today. Simon, hello from Athens. Uh, hi, Apostolos. It's great to see you again. Great to see you again on the digital stage. Uh, I'm sure that probably most of the people who are now watching know who Simon Anholt is, but let me just say a few words about him. He's recognized as the world's leading authority on national image. And I'm pretty sure that most of you have uh, at some point in your life read about his uh, famous nation brand index that started in uh, 2005. Now it's called the Good Country Index, a survey that ranks countries on their contribution to humanity and the planet. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for being with us uh, today. Let me pan the discussion um, Ten years earlier, we were in London, and uh, I was uh, doing an interview with you for uh, Tovima newspaper. You were telling me that international public opinion is the only superpower left on the planet. We're talking about soft power and hard power. What are the tools and weapons that a country possesses to, in a sense, compete in the international arena and, and gain what you described as the only superpower left? Mm. Um, it's not an easy job. Uh, this superpower um, of international public opinion is very unpredictable uh, and uh, it's very hard to maintain its attention. Uh, it's got a mental age of about seven. It's like a, 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 a child with, um, with a very short attention span. Um, the answer to your question is that... Um, What's happened to international public opinion over the last 10 or 15 years is that it has become increasingly driven by values or perceived values. And what more and more people around the world care about today uh, is whether people, organizations, companies and countries are actually helping things or whether they're not helping things, whether they're contributing something to the world that we all live in or whether they're not. And this is the reason why in the corporate sphere, corporate social responsibility has become so critical for all companies. Companies just cannot compete now on the, on the, on the marketplace unless they can demonstrate their environmental and social uh, credentials, unless they can show they're responsible players, unless they can show that they care about uh, pollution and species loss and habitat loss and uh, fair conditions for workers and all the rest of it. So this is kind of good news um, because it basically means that humanity has recognized that we are potentially heading in the wrong direction and we need to change our behavior. And they're expecting corporations to recognize that and to behave accordingly. And what I've noticed in my own research is that people are also expecting countries to notice the same thing and to behave in the same way. So you mentioned uh, two of my indexes there, the Nation Brands Index, which is an annual opinion poll, which since 2005 has been measuring people's perceptions of 50 different countries in great detail, which ones are popular, which ones do they admire? And that's important because the countries that people admire are the ones that they visit. They're the ones that they invest in. They're the ones whose people they hire. They're the ones whose products they buy. And then the other survey, which is a little bit newer and which I launched in 2014, is the Good Country Index. Now, that doesn't measure perceptions, that measures reality. And it tries to identify how much each country on Earth contributes to humanity and the planet outside its own borders. In other words, how much good does each country do? And the reason why I measure that is because it's very closely connected to the images of countries. It turns out that the countries people admire most are the countries that do most to contribute to humanity and the planet, to our survival as a species. So a country that wants to be admired has to do good. So I understand you're talking about the relevant country or a relevant co corporation. For but relevant in a, in a positive way. Well, I, I was just going to say that the, the you've heard me say this before, but the question that many governments over the years have asked me is basically, what can we say to make ourselves famous? And I always reply, that's the wrong question. The right question is, what can we do to make ourselves relevant? 
because just bragging about your assets and your achievements, it doesn't really change anybody's mind. It doesn't really attract anybody's attention. But countries that contribute something to the world that we all live in, they tend to get watched and they tend to get admired. That's the difference. Right. Ten years ago, back to that conversation, Greece was in the midst of uh, a huge financial crisis. I asked you uh, what comes in mind when talking about Greece. Mm. I think the question was mm. what comes in mind when I tell you made in Greece. And you said nothing. Mm. And I wonder 10 years mm. later whether your perception about mm. Greece has changed. Um, Well, it's difficult when you ask me a straight personal question like that because my own personal opinions are kind of irrelevant. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not a good representative of the world's population. Uh, a because I, I travel quite a lot. B because I've been to Greece. C because I'm very interested in other countries. Most people aren't like that. So, if I'm going to answer your question, pretending not to be me, pretending not to be Simon Anhold, but just speaking on behalf of the millions of people that we interview every year for the various surveys, I would say the answer is still nothing. Greece hasn't done anything in the last 10 years to raise its profile particularly, either up or down, by the way. Uh, the images of countries are incredibly stable, and it's almost as difficult for a country to damage its image as it is for it to improve its image. So the, the financial crisis didn't have any negative impact on the image of Greece. Um, it measured pretty much the same after um, the, the, the crisis began to, to, take, uh, to take root um, as before. And that's because people aren't stupid. They know that the financial crisis wasn't Greece's fault. It's like the pandemic. It doesn't affect the image of any country because it happens to every country. And we know that. So, so we don't suddenly right. think that a country Sorry, is I'm in the worst that. place. There is, but there are country, all countries face the pandemic, but there are countries mm. that kind of uh, uh, had a much better reaction to the pandemic and others didn't. Don't you think that the pandemic yeah. has an impact on the, on the image of the country? No, it really doesn't. And it's not what I think. It's what I know, because I'm measuring this constantly. So the, the latest edition of the Nation Brands Index came out last month. And despite nearly a year of pandemic, and despite, as you rightly say, some countries handling it very well and some countries handling it very badly, that wasn't reflected in any change in their images. And the reason for that is because uh, it's a purely domestic factor whether you manage it well or manage it badly. I mean, I can read the news and see that New Zealand has almost eradicated uh, the pandemic. And I can think to myself, good for New Zealand. Mm -hmm. But I don't benefit from that because I don't live in New Zealand. So right. it doesn't affect my perception of, of New Zealand. It doesn't make me a, a, admire it more or, or, or anything of the sort. But so sure, that maybe, hasn't... Maybe thought of Greece of a good destination during the summer because of the way it handled the pandemic uh, during the first wave. It's very, very marginal. So if I was sufficiently interested in Greece as a tourist destination that I was actually reading about these things, and I noticed when Greece was mentioned, because remember, Greece is just one of 195 countries. That's a lot of countries. Um, and I was planning a Mediterranean holiday, then yes, I might just notice, because I'd be looking for it, has Greece handled this well or has Greece handled it badly? And I might be peripherally aware I might think to myself, nah, Spain, they had some pretty high casualty numbers, so maybe it's better not to go to Spain. But this is very short term, and it's not anything much to do with the overall long-term image of the country. It's to do with my decision-making about my next holiday, which is really a different kind of domain. Um, it's more practical planning. Simon, in your index, uh, Greece is doing well in tourism. It's ranked number fifth but it's not doing as well in culture. It's ranked 42nd in 149 countries. And I wonder what, what, what's, what's the idea behind that ranking? Well, let me explain. The ranking you're talking about there is the good country index. It's not the nation brands index. Mm -hmm. So those ranks are nothing to do with what people think. Those are actually measurements of how effectively Greece is sharing its culture, uh, its landscape and so on and so forth. Um, with respect to the rest of the world. At least I presume you're talking about the Good Country Index and not the Nation Brands Index, yeah. Um, because in the Good Country Index, there's nothing there about tourism. The Good Country Index just basically measures um, as a proportion of the culture this country has, does it measurably share that better with the rest of the world 
than other countries do. So in the Good Country Index, if you rank low on culture, it's not because you have a bad culture. It's not because you don't have much culture. It's not because people don't like your culture. It's because the, sh the figures show that you're not being as active in the way that you engage the rest of the world in your culture as certain other countries do. So, for example, in the Good Country Index, um, a country which ranks very, very high in the overall ranking uh, in terms of culture is Ukraine. Now, most people would say, but Ukraine can't compete against China or Italy or Greece or, or Mexico on culture. Well, that's right, but that's not what we're measuring. What we're measuring is, as a proportion of the culture that Ukraine has, how effective and how active is it at sharing it outside its own borders, not just with its own population, but with the whole world. And the figures show that Ukraine is unusually proactive and unusually effective at sharing its culture internationally by all the measures that we have. Mm -hmm. It makes uh, a good point. Now, a decade ago, you also said that the purpose of the Good Country Project is to encourage and stimulate cooperation, the idea of collaboration and cooperation between countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder whether mm -hmm. more countries are really realizing it and uh, they're really willing to uh, do something about it. Oh, gosh, I wish it were true, Apostolos. I mean, it, it, the, the reason I say that is because Basically, um, humanity cannot cope with these big challenges like migration, like pandemics, like climate change, unless countries cooperate. I mean, uh, in Greece, in the European Union, we still see the effects of this every single day. I say we, even though I come from uh, an ex-member of the European Union, unfortunately. Um, we, we see that the migration um, challenge uh, is impossible to confront unless Uh, countries work together to solve it collectively. And the same is true on a bigger scale of absolutely every challenge that humanity faces. So unless countries can change their culture and start working together more regularly, more productively, more imaginatively, then we're never going to be able to solve climate change or the pandemic or anything else. So it's really, really essential. One of the things I say in my new book, uh, The Good Country Equation, is that we need to change the culture of governance worldwide from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. The, the problem with America first or Greece first or Britain first or Germany first is not the idea of putting your own country's interests first because obviously any leader has to do that. The problem is the idea that everybody else needs to come last. And that's where it starts getting dangerous for all of us because then who's looking after the planet? Who's looking after the people who are stateless? Who's looking after poverty and inequality? Nobody. So I guess the message of my book is that it's perfectly possible for countries to cooperate, collaborate, and compete at the same time. And if you do that and you do it well, you get better results. What you just said gives me, pass me the torch to, to, to answer, why is Germany leading your list? And why, is, why are the United States declining over the years? Okay, so there you're talking about the nation brands index. You're talking about the image uh, measurement. Um, Germany is the most admired country on earth, uh, basically because the US isn't at the moment. So ever since I started doing the nation brands index back in 2005, it was always between the United States and Germany for the most admired country overall, on average, worldwide. And the United States at the moment, after four years of um, persistent attacks on the international community um, from the Trump administration, is now down at number 10. And when the US isn't number one, Germany is number one because it is consistently um, perceived as the country that contributes most to the world outside its borders. Um, in Europe, of course, where people are closer to Germany, they have slightly more nuanced views. But in the rest of the world, everybody thinks that Germany is kind of the perfect country. Makes sense. Can I ask you, platforms like the Netflix, the platforms like like Netflix, mm. do they um, kind of help the impact? Uh, do, can, can, do they help the image of countries? For example, is Crown helping the UK in its image? Um, the images of countries are such enormously powerful and robust social and cultural constructs mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's absolutely unthinkable that anything as small as a TV program could really make any substantial difference to it. Right. I mean, you know, if you came up, if Netflix produced tomorrow the, the I Hate Britain 27-part series mm-hmm. and spoke about nothing but all the terrible things connected with Britain for, 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 for 27 series, it would have a tiny, tiny, tiny temporary effect on what people think about Britain mm-hmm. because people believe so deeply what they've always believed about countries and it's so difficult to make them change their minds. Mm-hmm. So something like The Crown... All that really does is just uh, basically refresh what the things that people already believe about Britain. If they like Britain, it refreshes their view that it's got this history, this heritage, the royal family, all of those cool things. If people don't like Britain, it refreshes what they already believe about the unfairness, about the inequality, about the elites who appear to run the country, um, the, the, the insincerity and the hypocrisy. It, it, everything that people see just reinforces what they already believe. And if it dramatically contradicts what they already believe, they'll just ignore it. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the distinction between nation brand and nation branding, because I Mm -hmm. guess that uh, a lot of people who are now watching presume that there are tools, uh, marketing tools that can help uh, change the image of a certain country. And I think that you disagree on that. I certainly do disagree. I've never, in in all the years I've been carefully uh, surveying and researching and measuring country images, I've never seen any correlation whatsoever between the amount of money that any country spends on promoting its image and the quality of that image. It just doesn't have any effect on it at all. Promotion, marketing, public relations can be very effective when you're selling a product or a service. So we're on Marketing Greece today, obviously, Part of the uh, the agenda here that people are considering all the time is attracting tourism. Attracting tourism is about selling a product. So advertising and marketing works. If you do good advertising, you spend a lot of money, you make sure that everybody sees it and it looks great, it will attract more tourists because tourism is fundamentally a marketing exercise. To some extent, so is foreign investment promotion. To a great extent, of course, so is exporting uh, goods and services from Greece. But the overall image of the country Uh, follows different rules. You cannot change the image of a country by sending out messages because the image of the country is deeply embedded in people's consciousness and they're not going to change it just because you you tell them something different. I mean, quite frankly, if it were possible for a country to change its image through messaging and through symbolism and through rhetoric, uh, then uh, you today, Apostolos, would not be living in the European Union. You'd be living in the Third Reich. Um, or, or the uh, or the Soviet Union, because frankly nobody understood branding better than Goebbels or Stalin, um, and they were very effective at doing propaganda domestically within their own sphere of control, because they controlled all the information, just as Kim Jong Un does today. He controls all the the information that that North Koreans receive, but nobody has ever succeeded in doing propaganda internationally. It's not possible. And if Greece were to spend $100 million a year starting now, telling everybody what a wonderful country Greece was, well, it might increase your tourism numbers, but it's not going to make people believe anything different from what they already believed about Greece. It just doesn't work that way. Simon, thank you very much for all the food for thought. And I look forward to our next encounter in Greece, hopefully at some point after the pandemic is over. That that would be wonderful. Thank you, Apostolos. Thank you very much.